So good morning. So I'm going to talk about um, domestic violence and child abuse and um, also just violence that we face in our world today. But I'll, first I wanted to share more about my story. Oh, thank you. Let me see, make sure I know how to work this thing. Is it on? Oh, there it is. First, I want to tell more about my story and so that you know a little bit of what happened to me and um, you know how God has helped me through my life with, with dealing with that. Um, all growing up, I'd always wanted to do some kind of profession to help people. And I used to think that would be um, being a nurse or a teacher. And it was during a career day at Chisholm Trail Academy that I first learned about social work. And I knew immediately that that's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to be a social worker. So I started studying at Southwestern Adventist. It was college then, not university. It's how long ago it was. And I started studying there to become a social worker. Well, during my senior year um, of college, I got the opportunity to start working part-time as a social worker at Johnson County Mental Health and Mental Retardation. And the area I worked in was working with um, victims that had mental health problems, all types of mental health problems. And we had a little program where um, we taught job skills and daily living skills and just help people try and get back into to functioning because they had this um, mental problem was keeping them from functioning like, like other people would. So I graduated on May 1st in 1988 and, you know, as you can think of, a lot of people, when they're graduating from college, it's such an exciting time. You know, you're on the threshold of adulthood, you're going to be independent, start your career. Um, I also had plans to go to graduate school at UTA and um, was going to go there to get my master's in social work. Well, 10 days after college graduation, on May 11, um, I was leaving with a group of the clients to go on an outing. And earlier in the day, one of the clients had been acting strange. He had, my coworker, um, it was her, her client, and she was working with him, trying to get him help, but he was acting really strange, and he'd left. And we didn't think anything more of it, but as I was leaving to go out to get in the van with take this group on an outing, he was at behind the van and he started shooting at us. The other clients jumped in the van and her and I went back into the building and he was chasing us, shooting at us the whole time. She, it was a very, very small little building. Um, he went one, she went one way and I went the other and was trying to call the police when he came up behind me. And he shot me three or four times in the back and chest. And I remember laying there on the ground, and I knew I'd been shot. I knew it was bad. But a tremendous amount of peace came over me. And I knew, and God let me know by that peace, that I was going to be fine, that I was going to be okay. So I never lost consciousness. I remember talking to people on the scene. I remember... Um, them taking me in the ambulance. I remember being in the helicopter. They took me to Walls first and then flew me by helicopter to um, Harris in Fort Worth. And I remember being in the emergency room um, and them working on me. And like I said, I, I knew it was bad, but I also remember thinking, you know, my family, especially my mom, is going to be so upset and trying to you know, signal her that I was okay because in my mind I was okay because God gave me that. But at the same time, they told my family that I wouldn't survive because I had been shot three or four times. Most of the bullets had gone straight through, um, and I had seven holes of a bull of seven bullet holes, and um, one of the bullets um, hit my scapula and my shoulder, you know, the shoulder blade, and broke that into tons of pieces. And those fragments and bone fragments went throughout my chest. Um, 
causing both my lungs to collapse. I lost a tremendous amount of blood. I, um, most major organs were failing. They had tubes down both sides of my nose, tubes down my throat, chest tubes, just everything to do to save my life. But, you know, and like I said, I remember everything. Well, one of the, it, it's funny looking back on it. One of the things I remember very clearly when I was in the emergency room, they were um, bagging me to help me breathe. I had a tube down my throat bagging me. And at some point, this the man that was doing that, he had to leave. And I don't, I don't wouldn't recognize him or anything, but I remember he was Asian. That's all I could tell you. But he had to leave for a minute, and the person that was doing it wasn't doing it right. And it was frustrating to me because I was laying there, and he would be like either too much air or too little air, the next person. And a few minutes later, he came back, and I was just like, oh, I'm so glad you're back because you know how just to do it just right. Well, I spent... Um, after a few weeks, after being in intensive care, they knew I'd survive, but one of the bullets had hit my spinal cord at T3, T4, which is right in the middle of your shoulders. And, um, but because it hit there, I was paralyzed. So I had to be transferred to a rehab hospital in Dallas. And there I was like having to learn everything all over again. You know, if you remember, here I was this brand new college, independent adult, starting off in life, and now I couldn't take a shower by myself. If I was laying down, I couldn't sit by myself. I couldn't get across the room by myself, because I, at first I couldn't, I had to learn how to use the wheelchair. And um, because my shoulder blade was shattered, I had a lot of pain um, in my upper body and my arms. So it was really difficult. Um, so rehab was a very difficult time to learn how to do all those things again, emotionally, physically, psychologically. Um, I had a huge support from family and church, and they helped me get it get through that time and from friends. One of the hard parts was just learning how to do everything and learning how to get through the pain of my injuries and um, they were really worried that my arm, because of the shoulder blade, that I wouldn't get full use of the right arm. And so one of the things, um, my therapist, she would always try and get me to stretch and stretch up and around and everything. One day she played a trick on me and she put me in front of a mirror and handed me some shaving cream and she told me to go as high as I could on that mirror and try and get that shaving cream up as high as I could. And I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. So I did it, I was all proud of myself. And then she handed me a cloth and told me to wipe it off, which, you know, up there, I could spray it hard, higher than I could reach. So it was, <laughs> I was kind of mad at her, but it was, it was a good challenge for me. Um, another funny thing after I got out of the hospital I thought of this morning was um, one of the things I learned how to, how to drive with hand controls and everything and when I was first injured I had a regular car, two door car and so they would teach me how to put that wheelchair in and out of the back seat of the car and I was able to do that and, and uh, be independent again after a few months of being home. Well, one day I went to the old HEB and I got my wheelchair out and was getting ready to get in it when before I know it, I hadn't locked it down and I see it going down the hill at HEB. <laughs> and I was praying that nobody would come and hit it. And luckily somebody saw it and brought it to me, but it was one of those um, funny hazards that happen. Um, I had the goal, like I said, of going on and getting my master's in social work. And the night before this happened, I'd completed the application to go and get my master's. And my mom asked me a few weeks later what, what she wanted me to do with that. And I told her, well, I want you to mail it because I still plan to go. Well, I got out of the hospital. I spent five and a half months in the hospital. And I got out in um, October, and in January, I started my master's in social work and graduated with it in 1991. And I've been able to work as a social worker. I work part-time at Cook's, and then I work with my mom on, um, with our agency, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. 
And so there were two texts that helped me a lot when I was going through all of my rehab and through my injury. And that first one was Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Someone had given me that on a little plaque and I had that in the hospital room. And the other one is Jeremiah 29 11. I know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring you about the future you hope for. So, like um, she was saying a few minutes ago that we started an agency, Disabled Crime Victims Assistance, in 1999. And the reason we started that is because through my injury, through what we went through as a family, through my mom's work as working with crime victims, since this has happened at Burleson Police Department, and through social work, my social work career, we realized there's a lot of people that have um, been injured through a crime, all different types of crime, that have a long-term disability. It could be a um, spinal cord injury, a head injury, amputation, blindness, um, being deaf. We've seen all those varieties. and But they they need resources. They need to know what's available to them, not only as a crime victim, but also as a um, person with a disability. So what we do is we um, meet with them and try and provide some initial support and let them know we understand where they come from. But we also help them with crime victims compensation, which is a state-funded program. We help them go to court. Um, we also provide them, help them know, understand what resources are available for um, their disability so that they can have both sides of that picture and know what, how, what can do to help them. Okay, make sure I was on track there. Let me give you a little statistics. Um, persons with a disability have four to 10 times greater risk of becoming a crime victim. Um, if you think about it, if, you, if someone's in a wheelchair or they use a walker um, or any kind of other disability, there's a lot of people, sad to say, that are out there to prey on somebody that has a disability and harm them or take advantage of them. Violence is the third leading cause for spinal cord injury, and about 20% of all head injuries um, is caused by some kind of form of violence. When we talk about domestic violence, there are a lot of individuals that are victims of domestic violence are hit in the head or um, over repeatedly. And just like they're talking about the um, football players with concussions, that repeated blow to the head causes long-term disabilities over time. It can cause loss of hearing, it can cause um, thinking processes, it can cause disabilities, and so there, um, that is a huge, huge problem with individuals that have been long-term with domestic violence. One, in, uh, one elderly person is victimized every two to seven minutes. And it's just really sad to think about that, you know, some of the most vulnerable people are the most victimized. I want to give you one example of um, a family that we helped that was a victim of domestic violence. Um, it was a lady that she lived in the, in the Metroplex and her mom called us, and this was an adult lady, she was probably in her mid-40s, and her, she had been abused in a domestic violence situation for a long time, and a friend of hers was just gotten concerned about her and alerted the police, and the police went by, and the man kept trying to turn away the police, but the lady came to the door, or he saw her, and he asked her to come out. Well, come to find out, she had been beating the head so much that she ended up in a nursing home. Her mom was too elderly to take care of her, but she ended up in a nursing home and died two years later. And we helped her mom through that process and gave her support. The sad thing is when she died, she was still married to the man. And he had control 
still in her death over um, what was gonna happen at the funeral. And it would not even allow for her to have anything but a graveside. So it was really sad that not only did he cause her to have to live in a nursing home, no telling what kind of pain she went through before then, but then even her death, her mom wasn't even able to have a service. And that's why it's really nice that the church has um, um, recognized that there is violence against women and families and that has started, I'm sorry, a campaign for end it now. Um, so, but before I want to do, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about domestic violence and about child abuse. And you know, I'm want to apologize that most of the time I will refer to that as women and children that experience that. But there are men that do experience that, and boys. It's just kind of becomes more natural because we know it's more prevalent with women being the victims. Although I'm not a survivor of domestic violence, I know that people, when they see me and they know my story, they see the physical effects. But they, people don't always see, they may think they know or, or, or something, but they don't always see the emotional and the psychological effects and the heartache people go through. Um, when they have some kind, or they've been some kind of form of violence. And, you know, but God is there for us and he helps com comforts us even when something like that is going on in our lives. In Psalms 10, 14, but you know God sees the trouble of the afflicted. You consider the grief and take it at hand. The victims commit themselves to you. Um, all victims experience some type of trauma, emotional, psychological damage, sometimes spiritual damage, as well as physical that comes from being victimized. The difference is we may not always see those scars. And we may, they may carry those, that person may carry those scars in their heart and souls for a long time and they may not even ever tell anybody. God may be the only person that knows their pain. However, as a church, we can lift that burden and we can help them find healing it, through their pain. We can help them see that Christ is there for them and we can help them find resources that can help them deal with it. In John 12, uh, 1, 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. So what is domestic violence? Domestic violence can be a, come in many forms. It can be physical, verbal, emotional. It can be controlling. It can be someone just putting somebody down, um, calling them names. It can be very psychological. This is um, what they call the, the wheel of domestic violence. And if you can see in the middle, it's a lot about power and control. Um, and it's all the different types of abuse that can happen using, lots of times the, the, um, the person will use isolation to control their victim. They'll threaten them, they'll intimidate them. And, one, and they'll use things like their children, their finances. Um, one of the things that they, why they put it in a wheel is because lots of times there'll be an incident it could be a very minor incident physically. It could be a very horrible incident of a physical abuse. And then the person, the abuser, will make up to them. They'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. Maybe even bring them flowers. They'll be just say all the right things, do all the right things. And then in a short time, the tension starts building again. And the victim feels that and gets on edge and then an incident happens again. And that circle could be all happen within a day, it could be weeks, it could be months, it could just be a few days that that whole cycle happens. So the victim's always living on edge and is always worried about what's going to happen. So how often does this happen? There's one in four 
women and one in seven at the age of 18 or over that have been abused of a domestic violence from a husband, a girlfriend, a boyfriend. It happens a lot in dating, young teenagers. There's a lot of, domestic, uh, of violence between teenagers as well as um, couples that are married or live together. There's, there's a potential that there could be a victim here now that has been in a domestic violence either currently or uncurrently because, you know, as a church, we're not immune from the, from the sin of the rest of the world. The pain that, that's, and even if no one is here that's in that situation, there could be very well many that have been grown up in a situation like that, were in a home that there was domestic violence. The pain that can grow up or from being in a relationship like that, that has been abusive, can last a lifetime. The effects of witnessing that are in the home, being a child victim or a victim of um, domestic violence can affect future relationships. It can cause depression, suicide, making situations difficult, making bad choices to try and escape the pain. There are a lot of great resources in the area. Johnson County has a um, really good crisis center and counseling center for victims of domestic violence. There's Safe Haven if you're in Tarrant County. One Safe Place services Johnson County, other surrounding counties in Tarrant County. And they're a resource where they have a lot of the community resources for domestic violence in one location. So there's Safe Haven, there's a job training program, there's police officers, there's counselors. So a victim can go there and receive all these services at one time and get referred and not have to go to all across town just to get those services. Women's Center in Fort Worth offers um, counseling for domestic violence vic any, or any kind of victim as well as rape crisis. Child Advocacy Center here in um, Cleburne as well as Fort Worth. There's also the um, Crime Victims Compensation, which is a program funded through the Attorney General's Office and we help um, individuals apply for that, but these other agencies do as well. And for victims of domestic violence, if you're not aware of this, if, they, if they've made a police report, they could be eligible for that program. And it'll pay for the victim to be able to move and get out of the situation. Lots of times they're so um, trapped in their situation because of the finances. They don't know how they'll support themselves or their children. And that's often used against them. So crime victims will pay for um, some deposits of rent, utilities, and for a few months rent. And they'll also pay for childcare if needed and for some loss of support for a few months because she's lost that income of her husband. So that's a really good resource for these women. So what can you do if you know somebody or as a church, what can you do if you, if you know um, someone that is in an abusive relationship? And so what, what can you say or what should you not say? The first thing is safety. Um, if there's an immediate situation going on, the first thing obviously is to call the police because you gotta be safe and get out of that situation. The next thing is if for some reason, maybe it's not um, an immediate problem, but something that the woman is ready to get out, then you still need to call the police and start making a safety plan. They can't, the, the biggest thing is they can't continue where they are. There's no healing that can happen in an environment that is not safe. If you remember the circle that I talked about, you know that things can be common in a relationship but that doesn't always last. Promises that somebody's going to change and next second it becomes violent again. It's like a war zone and the victim's always living on edge. So there's not a way to heal. On the outside, a victim may be all put together. She'd be very professional. She may be your neighbor, your coworker. It can happen in any environment, any 
um, social, economical, um, race, or ethnicity. There, I have a story of a, a coworker that I worked with for a long time. She was a nurse, and she was actually a charge nurse. And um, very professional, I'd worked with her, didn't know anything, and one day she started telling me that she, had le she was leaving her husband. And I was, you know, just talking to her about that and, and asking her, you know, well, what happened? And she said, well, I decided to leave, I finally decided to leave when he told me he was gonna shoot me in the head next time. And I had no clue whatsoever that she would been living in that. And it didn't sound like it had nor necessarily been always um, physical violence, but there was a lot of control, a lot of power that he inflicted, a lot of uh, psychological, emotional. Um, if she, when she got home, he took care, he would, she'd have to turn over all the money to him. Um, he would tell her when she could go take a bath, when she could eat, when she could do it, go to bed. And here this, she was a nurse in charge of this whole unit and was very put together and nobody knew that that was going on in her life. And sometimes as Christians we're taught to be forgiving and we're taught to give somebody another chance. However, forgiveness can't happen in an environment or relationship that could eventually cost somebody their life or their child's life. A person that's in an abusive relationship can't forgive because there's not a trust that that will never happen again. Forgiveness is about moving forward in our hearts and letting God heal it of what's broken by some of them. However, that person cannot truly do this and stay in that verse environment. Safety has to happen first. You know, if you were talking with a friend that was in a job where when they showed up at work, they would never know if the boss was going to yell at them or put them down or call them names or maybe even push them against the wall or hit them. You would tell them they need to leave that job and not go back. It's the same thing. You can't, you have to help your whoever you know to not stay in that environment and be safe. So, what is child abuse? Let's put this back. Child abuse is physical neglect, sexual abuse, emotional, and verbal. There's a, a lot of different signs that could happen about children that are abused. And um, if you see here that there, today, that there will be 185 children that will be victims of abuse. That's a lot. That's a really sad. It could be a variety. And it's all of our responsibilities that if we're worried, the law doesn't say if we know that there's abuse going on, it only says if we suspect it. And if you're in a, in a profession like a teacher or a nurse or um, some kind of medical profession as well as others, you're required by law and there, there's actually penalties if you don't report. And it's really only if you suspect it. Um, that's the most important thing. And the other thing is to call the police if there is a concern. These are some of the signs. Oh, there's the reporting number. Sorry, I'm not looking back every time. <laughs> oh, there's some of the signs of, of child abuse. And it's sad, but I wish that all of our churches were immune, immune from child abuse, but and that if anybody walked in their door that they would not, walked in our doors of our churches, that they wouldn't have to experience that in their lives. But that's not the way it is that, you know, the sins of the world affect our children of our churches just as much. There are a lot of people that have lived and may live their whole life and never have told somebody of the abuse. And, be, and that's often because they're manipulated or threatened. And sometimes they may go years or their whole lifetime. But God sees um, their pain and he sees that they have been scared and ashamed. And he is saddened by this. And he can heal the hearts of every adult, child, man or woman that someone has taken advantage of. God provides comfort to us in Isaiah 6. 66, 13, as a mother 
comforts her child, so he will comfort you. And in Galatians 4, 7. So you are no longer a slave, God is child, and since you are his child, God has made you his heir. One of the things about child abuse, too, is that you know, we need to be providers and safety for our children. And so if there's a concern, there is a lot of help out there for them. We all see how this world has drastically changed and we each week we hear the horror stories of violence in our world, of mass shootings, shootings of officers, terrorists, and we watch in horror and sadness. But then at moments we realize that you know, we get sometimes feel immune to it because it's being so common. However, that is what the devil wants. He wants us to be immune and complacent to what he's doing and what he's destroying. We need to unify against him. It's not us against this group or that group. It is us against evil and only evil that the devil is trying to destroy and create chaos and confusion and distrust in our lives. We need to turn to our Savior so we can discern the good from the evil, and we know there's a greater purpose for this fight against evil. As we come, as we trust in God, we will know that at the end of time that he is there for us. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud cry and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will come together and with him in the clouds to meet him in heaven. We don't want to lose sight of the real purpose. We need to keep our focus on him, not to be discouraged and to understand that these end of times, things may get worse. So in, in Matthew 5, 9, it said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You know, we can all be there to help a victims, whether it be somebody um, that we know personally or somebody that um, God has put in our life to help in that situation. Or we can also volunteer or help organizations that help crime victims or at a police station. And we can be there to help victims that we may come across so that they can seek wonderful resources and counselors and Christian counselors that can help them heal their broken hearts. But most importantly, we want to know that God has a plan and he's always there for each one of us, even those darkest times. And I, I just wanted to also go back and, and tell another story about... Um, our agency with disabled crime victims and how God has um, opened some doors and, and blessed us with with that. You know, when you when God puts that mission on your heart to help um, other people and, and, and it's been something that you've gone through, you're kind of lost on um, how that should be and where that's going to play out. So just one little quick story. My mom actually tells this story much better because she's a better storyteller, but we um, have an office in Fort Worth. It's kind of off of 30 at Forest Park near the zoo area, right over in near there. And um, when we first started it, we started out of my mom's house in Keene. And then, but we knew we needed to get to a location to be recognized in the community. Um, you know, when you say, well, you have this, but you're working out of your house, and that's it doesn't always come over across when you're talking to victims or to other people. So we set out to find that, and my mom looked for nine months for a location. And we had a few mishaps of places that we thought would work, and then it fell through, and we kept going, she kept going back to this one building and um, that we're at now, and this the second or third time, the lady who was helping her said, well, I think I found a place. But she had somebody in that office, so she talked that person into moving upstairs and put us in that office, which is a little three-room office. And the thing is, you know, when God has a plan for you to be in a location, and he... 
He has a plan for you to help somebody. He'll open the door. And um, we never knew what that door was going to be. Here we had an office, but, you know, we, we weren't even sure how we were going to pay the rent, how we were going to pay the phone bill. Um, and so God opened up doors along the way and has continued to open doors as we've, as we've done that. But the, the one part that I'm going to share the, of that is that after we were there about nine months, the, the same lady, Linda, from the management office, came to us and said, you know, we, we see what you're doing and we want to help your victims at Christmas. And they've done this every year since. We will pick two to four or five families, depending on what they think they can do. And the whole building adopts them for Christmas. We'll put their story out there with little um, wants and needs on, a, on like on an angel tree. And people will come by and pick those up and donate either money or get by gifts. And these families will come in and here they've been heartbroken and they're struggling how sometimes to pay the rent and buy food um, because their loved one is now devastated and they're all devastated, the whole family, because of this crime. And they will have from here to there of, tr of pres presence because they, every item gets picked by somebody every year. We always worry about it. At the end, it's all done. And they will also be giving... Um, Lot, lots of times family members will bring in um, gift cards and then we'll, we had a group last year from a high school that brought shampoo and paper towels and toilet paper, big boxes of everything that they needed for that family. And some, a couple of the family, they were just as excited about that stuff because that adds up so much as they were about all the presents. And so I just wanted to share that example as I close. So thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.